You can continue recording. Okay. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Venom, you should be able to put the screen share back on. I apologize. I took it down for a moment just because I knew people would want ah. to see you. Okay, no problem. No, no problem. So <laughs> yeah, Avram Perpinovich, yes, who uh, by that point was, as as you can tell, uh, in his uh, in his late eighties. He was a charming, charming uh, man, and I fell in love with the way he talked. The uh, screen is blank. There's nothing there. Really? Are you sure? You don't even see the name? Only the name. The name, okay. Now, this is what Avram Karpinovich looked like at the time. Yes, he was born in Vilna. I can still remember, um, remember my conversation uh, I, I, that I had with him. It was a brief conversation toward the very end of the seminar. It was a few weeks. And in those few weeks, I managed to learn enough Yiddish to be able to put together a list of questions for um, Karpinovich. And I approached him at the end of the seminar. We sat down uh, on a bench, uh, very much like the one you see in that picture. And I, um, I asked him my questions in Yiddish. And he was very, um, very uh, noble and generous uh, in, um, uh, um, in, in pretending that I was another uh, native Yiddish speaker, a Yiddish intellectual. This is how he addressed me, as if he foresaw that one day I would be able to understand everything he said. And uh, it took me uh, a few weeks to decipher this interview when I came back to Moscow with that tape. Um, and I uh, still remember almost everything he said. He told me, um, I asked him, um, I asked him uh, which book of his I should begin, um, I, should, I should read first. He was a Yiddish writer. I knew that he was a Yiddish writer. I had never read anything that he wrote. He wrote short stories, and this is what he told me. Um, um, you should start with my latest book that I wrote with short stories about Vilna. In my Erzählungen beschreibech, Jene Gestalten, was haben nicht gelebt, auf ein, was haben nicht gelebt im Zentrum von unserem Leben. Sie haben gelebt auf dem Rand von unserem Leben. Jüdische Ganovim, jüdische Gassenmädler, jüdische Träger, so noch ein solcher Leid. Und aufgewegen sei habe ich geschrieben. Uh, so he told me he, his, his story is focused on marginal uh, characters uh, from the Vilna, from, from the Jewish world of Vilna, um, the, um, uh, the um, uh, world of Vilna as he observed it in the uh, interwar period. Um, thieves, prostitutes, uh, people who are very poor. Um, and then he says, Sie fliegen alle kommen, sie fliegen kommen in Theater, der Rieke Schabese nach und ich habe sich zugehört zu sehr Sprach, zu sehr besonderen Loschen 
Und ich habe das Salz verloschen zwischen die Tollen von meinen sechs Bücher. So he used the opportunity that um, um, the, the, the opportunity um, of learning a lot about these uh, these people and listening to their to the way they spoke, their jargon, their special expression words, um, because they all came to his father's theater. His father was uh, the director of a Yiddish uh, Volkstheater in Vilna. And, um, and this is, yes, he says, nobody else would, would have written about them. So I felt it was my duty. And at the end of that interview, I asked him to share a song that he mentioned in one of his lectures a few days earlier. And he said, he, he, he sort of laughed and then said, okay, sure. Um, you know, I'm, uh, my, my singing voice, he said, is not at its best and there's no accompaniment, but I'll do what I can. And I later, found the original of that song. So I learned it in its entirety. And this is uh, the first song I would like to share with you so that uh, you, you, you see where my Yiddish journey started with what kinds of um, characters and images. Here's my guitar. Uh, I hope I will be um, heard. If not, please let me know. And um, let me, yes, this is Avram Karpinovich. Uh, he, um, he arrived in uh, Palestine before the state of Israel was established. He survived the war mostly in the Soviet Union. Uh, he was able to, uh, to escape. Um, and uh, then he came to, uh, to, to Israel and lived in Tel Aviv and was very active in Yiddish, the, 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 the Yiddish cultural life uh, in Israel uh, throughout these uh, post-war uh, decades. Um, now, yes, the song is called Ich ganve in der Nacht. So you can see that it is, uh, it, it, it includes those characters that he mentions as his favorite. <laughs> Ich ganve in der Nacht, die Nacht ist heuscher schwarz, und du hast mich verzapelt, gelachend mir mein Herz. Als ich ganve, ist doch gut, mein Lied ist immer als ich teug. Ich bin doch ein Bär, das Weißel von dein Eug, es tun sie nicht schaden, keine Masse machen. Mit Stadtparade sind mir Blatt, sind mir Blatt. Spiel Pabole, nur die Rolle. Und sag mir ja, are ja, are ja. Ich gehe weg zu dein Herz, es ist nicht kein Kapital. Und du hast mir der Dusche, mir zu gedrückt die Gau. Als er dusche ist doch gut, meine Liebschaft ist doch groß. Er trägt von dir das Beis, kein das Büter nicht scharreus. Es tun sie nicht schaden, keine Masse machen. Mit Stadtparade sind mir Blatt, sind mir Blatt. Spiel paar Wolle, noch die Rolle. Und sag mir ja, hare ja, hare ja. Ich lache a brillant, in perlach a beich, zum so sehr dir gengor, mit Jossele dem Deich. So hat Jossele gesagt, als ich bin an Antik, er sagt, er wird mir schenken, a größer Kuppe gelick. 
das Kniepickel es glanzt. Es spielt doch wie ein Smick. Let me fix that. Ich mach nicht lang kein Scheiles, nur take if mach ich ich. No schein, no schein, no schein, auf Schneid oder Riggs die Gall. Willst du Narrele schön wieder rein in Kriminal? No schein, ich will nicht gehen, mit Jossele mehr gehen. No, you know what? I thought this would work, but I think that I'm going to use a different method of switching um, switching these uh, slides. There. No shoy nechevel ni de gay, mit yosele mer gay, to vel mir kein boyne, foren blois in zwei. Also, ist take gut, ich mein doch oto dos, wer sei die Balle boste. Unir der Bale was stolz nicht schaden, kein Masse maten. Mit Stadt parat, sind mir blatt, sind mir blatt. Spiel pa Wolle, noch die Rolle, und sag mir ja, Are ja, Are ja. Now, I just want to mention that Harayat is, of course, the beginning, the opening, uh, the op it's the opening words of the blessing recited under the chuppah, um, the, 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 the wedding ceremony. So when she tells him, Zog Miryat Harayat, say Harayat to me, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a clear invitation to... Uh, to 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 get to marriage, um, and there are some words in this song that are specific to um, the uh, speech of thieves, criminals, the, the 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 Jewish underworld. For instance, the word uh, boine, the form boine, which is uh, a nickname for Buenos Aires or a knipical, a word for, um, for a, a knife, and so on, there, there are others. So I was, I was uh, fascinated by the song and by the other stories he, um, he shared. Not all of them were about the underworld. And uh, he also spoke a lot about the tragedy of uh, losing the city of his youth, the culture of his youth, that whole world that collapsed. And in the end, he came to Israel. Uh, why Israel? He told me that before the war, he was actually um, opposed to uh, You know, whether it was, uh, we, we, we didn't, uh, uh, go into uh, discussing whether it was uh, short-sighted on his part or whether it was justified at the time, but he was very skeptical of the idea. Um, instead, he was, uh, uh, he was um, in favor of developing Yiddish culture in Eastern Europe. And so how, co how come he, um, went to uh, live in Tel Aviv. He told me that after the war, he wanted to be together with the rest of his people. And the most obvious destination was, was, uh, was Israel, even though Yiddish was at the time, uh, you could say persecuted in Israel. It certainly wasn't easy for a Yiddish writer to get published, to get um, support um, uh, to 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 have his voice heard, um, and you know, uh, I mean, we've we've all been 
following uh, the events and recent events in the Middle East. Uh, so it's, I feel like uh, the things I mentioned have these political connotations even today. Um, and uh, since, since I mention it, I would like to say a couple of words about how I have to deal with this issue in my teaching. Uh, McGill can be a very politically, uh, politically active environment. Uh, the campus is, 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 is um, especially at such uh, uh, moments of, 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 of great tension uh, in the Middle East, uh, you have people of all kinds of um, stances and opinions, and sometimes heated arguments can, can begin. And my job is to prevent it from ruining the uh, inclusive and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, productive uh, atmosphere in uh, class conducive to learning and instead to turn it into a learning opportunity. Um, I must mention that students come to Yiddish for many different reasons, but one of those reasons is because Yiddish is often seen as a kind of alternative to, uh, to Israel, to Hebrew. Mm. And indeed, for some people, it is, uh, whether it's the uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews opposed to Zionism or some of my students who uh, feel uh, very strongly about Yiddish for the same reason. Um, and uh, they may expect that they will not uh, encounter anything controversial in my class because it's all about Yiddish. But of course, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Yiddish, uh, Yiddish culture that deals with Israel and Zionism and all these issues. And uh, one of the poems I often share with my students and it's a perfect poem for studying the past, uh, no, not the past tense, the conditional. If I were, then things would be, you know. Uh, so it's an important uh, grammatical uh, construction. Uh, you know, the, like in that uh, Yiddish uh, proverb, as the, as, uh, as the Bobe wollt gehat reder, wollt sie gewen a tramvai. If grandma had wheels, she would be a, um, a, a trolley bus. So um, to, um, to uh, show how the conditional is used in Yiddish literature, I sometimes share this poem by Avrom Sutskeve, uh, the great Yiddish poet, considered one, to be one of the greatest Yiddish poets of, uh, of, of, of all time. Um, and um, this is, this is Sutzkever, uh, Sutzkever as a young man. And note that he was born the same year as uh, Avram Karpinovich. And indeed they were later neighbors in Tel Aviv and uh, good friends. Uh, Sutzkever was uh, famous uh, uh, even before the war as, as a, uh, Mm, very uh, in, innovative and uh, brilliant Yiddish poet, but during the war he had to uh, um, adopt a very different lifestyle as a Jewish uh, partisan fighter in the woods around Vilna, in the forests around Vilna, and he was in the Vilna ghetto for a while. And throughout those, those, uh, uh, that ordeal, he continued writing poetry, which is what he uh, later claimed had, had saved him. Um, when, he, um, when he came to Israel, and this, it was around 1950, I 
maybe 1949, he uh, stayed in Moscow in the Soviet Union for a while. He even uh, he was even an official delegate at the Nuremberg trials, uh, representing the Soviet Union. Uh, he was sent there by the Soviet government to describe what he had witnessed, the Nazi crimes he had witnessed in uh, Vilna. Um, when he arrived in, 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 um, in Israel, he wrote a poem called uh, Shecheyono. Shecheyono, which um, is of course the uh, famous blessing uh, recited on joyous occasions. Um, and in this poem, he not only uh, displays his uh, excellent command of the conditional, um, but he shares his very strong emotions about being reunited with this land. And um, I must also mention that Sutskever was a very, uh, was, was famous for um, coining new words, for being very flexible uh, with, with language. And uh, there is a word in this poem, um, Fargoit. It's a word that you will not necessarily um, find in the dictionary, but its meaning is obvious. Uh, the root is goi, non-Jew, and fargoit would mean, um, would refer to a state of having lost touch with one's Jewish roots. Um, there is also there there is also another word in this poem, which comes from the uh, religious vocabulary, akeda, uh, the Yiddish Hebrew term for uh, the sacrifice, sacrifice of Isaac, and the word akeda in the context of this poem clearly refers to uh, to to the Holocaust. Now, this is what, um, what the poem sounds like. And I will, um, I will uh, share both uh, translated uh, Yiddish original and my literal translation. Here it is. Wenn gewollt nicht sein mit dir benannt, nicht otemen das Glück und Weide, Wenn Gott nicht brennen mit dem Land, vulkanisch Land in Hevle Leide, wenn Gott hat sind noch mein Akede, nicht mit geboren mit dem Land, wo jeder Stendel ist mein Seide, gesättigt wollt mich nicht das Bräut, das Wasser nicht gestillt mein Gummen, bis euch gegangen, Gott vergeut. Und bloß mein Bengschaft wollt gekommen. Um, now, I started talking about the uh, various reasons why students uh, become interested in, in Yiddish. Mm, it's for many, these are. Uh, family, uh, family inspired uh, uh, aspirations, uh, curiosity, but many of my students aren't Jewish. As a matter of fact, um, and by the way, when I talk about my Yiddish teaching, I'm not, me, I'm not uh, solely referring to McGill, I also, um, I also teach at various summer programs. I've taught at other universities. Um, so when I was um, speaking of Tel Aviv, when I uh, taught at the summer program in Tel Aviv, the Yiddish summer program at Tel Aviv University, one of my students there was Chinese. 
And not only was she crazy about Yiddish, she wanted to write original poetry in Yiddish. And I, at first I was a little skeptical, but she kept insisting uh, that she would like to try and she would like to, she would like my, um, my assistance, my editing assistance. And um, she, um, she performed her original Yiddish song, um, which is a version of, of, of a popular Chinese song. Now, but since, since I helped her translate, even though my Chinese is uh, non-existent, um, I can tell you that the song is the, the, the translation, it's not so, it's not really a translation, it's more of an adaptation um, inspired by. Um, now, what would inspire a Chinese student to, to study Yiddish, to delve into uh, the uh, minutia of Yiddish grammar, to be curious about um, different Yiddish dialects. Um, well, let me first of all show you uh, what her performance looked like. This is the final day of the, of the seminar and uh, the video of our Yiddish Chinese song was later, uh, was later posted in, uh, published on, uh, in, in YouTube um, with a very sensationalist title, the first ever Yiddish Chinese duet. Da, da, da. Um, I even tried singing in Chinese at some point. Um, so let me show you an excerpt from that video, and then and then we'll talk more about that interesting phenomenon. New share. And here we go. Yes. <laughs> so on the screen, on the on the white screen behind us, you can see uh, the Chinese original and the Yiddish translation. Um, now nobody in the audience, and the audience consists of about 70 people, 70 students from all over the world, uh, and uh, the, the other faculty, uh, the rest of the faculty, uh, nobody of course needs uh, transliteration. By that point, after five weeks of intense Yiddish, uh, intensive Yiddish, everyone, uh, everyone can read the olive base. Let me. And so on, and I can't uh, resist. Nascent <laughs> Chinese. Anyway, it was a big success, um, and um, uh, it turns out that Yiddish, Yiddish was uh, uh, had by that point been. Uh, um, Popular, popularized in China, uh, works by Isaac Bashevis Singer um, have been translated into Chinese and works by other Yiddish writers. And there is a lot of curiosity in China about the, the history of the Jewish people. Um, and they don't just go for the, for the obvious, you know, Hebrew, uh, again, Israel, they are also curious about that uh, lesser, studied uh, 
chapter and uh, language. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it's easier to appeal to students who come from countries that have some connection to Yiddish. There may be no Yiddish speakers left there today, but there is a, a strong historic, uh, historical and cultural and sometimes even linguistic link between um, that student's um, country and Yiddish language and culture. And um, I once tried to take advantage of this uh, by um, conducting uh, a campaign, uh, awareness campaign about Yiddish uh, classes on the campus of uh, the campus of Harvard University, where I taught for uh, over uh, six years, six, seven years. Yes, it's hard to believe how, how long I stayed there. Uh, this was simultaneously with uh, working on my PhD at Columbia. So I, I moved to New York City, started graduate school at Columbia, but I soon went back to Cambridge, Massachusetts and began teaching uh, while, uh, while simultaneously remaining a graduate student at Columbia. Um, and um, that campaign I conducted at Harvard was, was necessary because the one problem I often had was to recruit enough students. Um, I felt that we really had something unique to share, uh, but for many people, it was not something that would have occurred to them unless they saw a poster or heard uh, um, about a Yiddish concert, a Yiddish event. So I would organize those during the first week of the school year. And the campaign I conducted um, consisted of uh, putting up posters in different languages. Uh, the Yiddish, uh, Yiddish uh, uh, scholarly Yiddish website um, um, uh, later uh, published an article describing this, this campaign, so I can show you what it looked like, uh, my, my Yiddish posters. Uh, here they are. Mm -hmm. It's called Yiddish in Alle Lende, Harvard's campaign for Yiddish. Uh, this is back in 2015. Yes, this was, uh, this was the English poster, Go Beyond Chutzpah. Um, everybody, uh, most people in America know the word chutzpah, but I was inviting students to go beyond that and learn uh, hundreds and thousands of other Yiddish words, expressions, songs, idioms, stories, and so on. And I always love quoting uh, Isaac Beshevis Singer's Nobel lecture uh, from uh, 1978, where he talks about Yiddish uh, as a language uh, that has not yet said its last word, and a language that in a certain uh, figurative way is the wise and humble language of us all the idiom of the frightened and hopeful humanity. So this kind of universality is something I strive to, um, to, to, to present and explore in my teaching, whether it's my language courses or uh, literature courses. Mm, I taught three different levels of Yiddish every semester, elementary, intermediate, advanced. And uh, so this, this, it sounds very serious. Um, but when it came to advanced Yiddish, I would often have 
one student, two students, um, because the majority of students who took first year Yiddish, uh, well, some of them might take another year of Yiddish, but counting on someone taking three years of Yiddish, three years in a row was, um, was not, not fully realistic. Um, and here's, here's my campaign. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, Yiddish events, the Yiddish Sweets and Culture Open House at Harvard Hillel. Then we have a poster in Polish. And so on. I, I myself speak Polish. Uh, but I, uh, I uh, uh, asked a, a Polish friend of mine to edit it just in case, and she helped. This is Romanian. Um, and you see, one of the questions on the poster is, are you from Romania or Moldova? If so, you may have special reasons for... Um, uh, being curious about Yiddish. Uh, and as part of that poster, I included a, um, a, a, a scan of an old uh, Romanian uh, Yiddish poster from the 1930s in two languages, Yiddish and Romanian. Uh, it's an announcement about a, uh, a lecture by Dr. Ehrlich. Uh, a lecture um, titled Bundism, uh, Bund und Zionism, right? So Bundism and Zionism. Um, Ukrainian, Russian, that one I could do on my own. Um, German, this is the most exotic looking language. And of course it is, uh, it is Magyar, Hungarian. So that's, that's the campaign. Uh, was it successful? To some extent, I think I had uh, more, more, uh, more students that, that year than, uh, than usual. Um, now, when, when I started teaching Yiddish at Harvard, I would often, um, you know, I would often encounter a very strange reaction. I would tell someone, say, I was flying on an airplane, and uh, people asked me what uh, what I what I did for a living. I would say I teach Yiddish at Harvard. People would um, burst out laughing. It sounded like a joke. There was something, uh, something. Um, inherently funny about that combination of Yiddish as something associated with home, with something humble, something that, you know, as many people say, their parents used uh, to uh, prevent their kids from, from, from understanding. So the language of, you know, uh, your parents, uh, uh, arguing about something or having a fight uh, or hiding some secrets, uh, but not necessarily trying to pass it down to the next generation, right? So many people told me about how their parents were fluent in Yiddish, but didn't do anything to teach their kids because it felt uh, irrelevant. It was sort of this old, you know, old, uh, um, legacy of the shtetl, the old country. Yes, there were some jokes, there were some songs, some com stand-up comedy, but it, you know, there, there, there. Even among Jews themselves, there is that uh, popular misconception that Yiddish doesn't have a grammar. So how can you study? How can you properly study it at, at Harvard, no less? if it doesn't even have a normal grammar. Um, so of course Yiddish does have grammar, but this association of Yiddish with humor is something that I, 
um, that 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 is of course um, part of the appeal because Yiddish is wonderful for telling jokes, even though no language is an inherently funny. It's only as funny as you make it. Um, but there are many funny stories in Yiddish and I do use a lot of humor in my teaching. Um, and uh, in fact, I thought I would share at least one, uh, one of my favorite Yiddish jokes with you. Uh, but before I do it, give me one second. I need to fix the light here. One second. I am back. And here is the joke. Now, I thought about how to uh, best to tell you the joke, given that I imagine some of you uh, speak Yiddish, some of you know more Yiddish, uh, others less, but I'm not counting on, 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 on uh, uh, you know, uh, everyone being able to, under, to, to follow the Yiddish. So I prepared a, um, I prepared a uh, translation, uh, a, a sentence by sentence translation. So I'll be telling the joke and you will be seeing the translation. Uh, let me make sure you see the... Uh, da, 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 da. Hmm. Oh, I think I know what happened. Uh, your share. There you go. A quarrel. You can see it, right? Okay. So here's the joke. And mm, joke is told by, um, by a, uh, an adult man reminiscing about his uh, earliest days on, 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 uh, in this world, on this earth. Noch eider, ich bin geboren geworden is schon given a milchome. Nicht ka welt milchome, nor a milchome zwischen meine tate mame wie a zoime soll mir an nomen geben. Mein tate hat gewollt, dass er soll heißen noch sein taten. Und mein mame hat gewollt, dass er soll heißen noch er taten. Haben sie sich beide herumgekriegt und mir hat nicht gekannt da durchkommen. So der tate lo mir gehen zum Rov, er soll passen. Frag der Rov bei meinem Tate. Sagt mir, Reb Yid, wie hat geheißen, er Tate? Sagt mein Tate, Itzig. Frag der Rebbe bei meinem Namen. Sagt mir, Yid, und wie hat geheißen, er Tate? Sagt die Mama, Itzig. Sagt der Rov, da was spart er sich. Geht er heim und geht er ihr Sohn an Namen Itzig. Nein, er versteht nicht, Rebbe. Weil mein Tati Itzig ist gewinner Rov und sein Tati Itzig ist gewinner Balle Golle. Und ich will, als mein Sohn soll es nach mein Tati Itzig, nicht nach sein Tati Itzig. Hat der Rebbe der Rov gepasst, also ich. Koidem geht er heim und brave dem Briss. Und später wird man sehen. Wird er so neues wachsen, wird er heiß nach deinen Taten. Und wird er neues wachsen, Ballegole, wird er heiß nach deinen Taten. No, bin ich Karov, kein Ballegole bin ich euch nicht. Nach heißen, heiß ich jetzt. It's a, I think it's a wonderful joke because it really, it covers so many key uh, themes of Yiddish humor. You know, the, uh, it's, it's sort of reminiscent of the joke about, you know, building uh, uh, three synagogues on a desert island. 
you know, the, the, the arguing, uh, the, 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 the husband and wife fighting, you know, the mother uh, talking about how her son has to grow up to be a rabbi. Uh, so it's, 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 it's perfect. And of course, there's the rabbi. Um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the Paskinen, uh, this uh, um, Talmudic um, reasoning that so many Yiddish jokes, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, take advantage of or um, use for, uh, for, for humorous uh, purposes. Um, now, um, I, um, let me, one, one second. Um, second, I just want to, there you go, okay. Um, so, um, as I said, um, I have students from, many different backgrounds. Some are religious, others secular, some are Jewish, others aren't. Um, but everybody enjoys exploring, uh, learning about Judaism because Judaism is such, a, is such an incredibly important part of Yiddish. You really can't, can't study Yiddish without discussing a lot of religion, and this is it's 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 a uh, it's a strange thing. It's it's ironic in a way when um, I mentioned that I grew up in Moscow, and one of the first Yiddish books I was able to find in Moscow were Soviet Yiddish publications. Now in the Soviet Union, Yiddish spelling was transformed into a perfectly phonetic system, meaning that all words of Hebrew and Aramaic origin had to be spelled phonetically. And they went even further. Uh, the uh, Soviet Yiddish spelling reformers got rid of the final uh, letters, final shapes of letters, such as mem, nun, chof, uh, just to simplify. It was that spirit of simplification, uh, you know, to make it efficient, efficiency, efficiency above, above all, and, you know, uh, ease of uh, learning, education. Um, and uh, so uh, while in traditional Yiddish spelling, the word Shabbos has three letters, Shin Beisam Sof. In Soviet Yiddish, it has five Shin, Aleph, Beis, Ayin, and Samech, Shabbos. Um, and um, Soviet Yiddish culture is something that I was less interested in when I first discovered uh, Yiddish because it felt so limited. It was only later that I came to appreciate certain uh, important uh, scholarly uh, um, works that had been published in the Soviet Union on Yiddish literature, uh, Yiddish poetry, uh, even some Yiddish poetry created in, in, in Birobidzhan, that uh, autonomous Yiddish region on the border of, uh, of China. Uh, that you know was uh, was was created in the 1920s and uh, approved by Stalin. Um, I uh, I always liked singing, and I uh, throughout my childhood I sang many Russian songs. Um, I must mention that I also knew Tumba Lalaika in Yiddish by by heart from age seven or so. That was the one song I knew as a, the one Yiddish song I knew as a child. 
but when I started reading uh, about Yiddish and looking for Yiddish speakers, Yiddish books in Moscow, I discovered that Soviet Yiddish poets had translated Yiddish songs into, uh, sorry, translated Russian songs, popular Soviet songs into Yiddish. And that was a great way to connect with, um, um, with um, uh, potential Yiddish students in Moscow because my first Yiddish teaching experience was at Moscow State University. Um, and singing these very popular Russian songs in Yiddish was so, was often so unexpected um, that it really caught people's attention and provoked many questions. Um, and one example that I wanted to share with you is this famous song, Podmaskovne uh, Vichera, um, Moscow nights or evenings outside of Moscow. Um, and this is, this is what it looks like. Yeah. Moscow Nights. Now, it was translated by Arne Vergilis. Uh, Arne Vergilis, who was the editor in chief of the Yiddish magazine um, Sovetish Heimland, Soviet homeland, our Soviet homeland. Um, and I'm sure many of you have are familiar with the uh, with, with the melody at least. Geloschen scheun alle Feiern still es wird der Sod und Vertrag und ich weiß erzählt wie sie steier mir hinter Moskwe der Rad der Nacht und ich der <laughs> Kling das Lied, und es schweigt das Lied hinter Moskwe hinab der Nacht. Gewell dir, Liebinke, heint vor euch Sorgen, Joren glickelche ohne Schir, schwerer Sagen und nicht euch sagen, was es tut sich in Herz bei mir. Schwer euch sagen und nicht euch sagen, was es tut sich in Herz bei mir. А рассвет уже все заметнее. And so on. Um, but uh, from the Yiddish, uh, Yiddish, Yiddish songs, uh, Russian songs translated into Yiddish, I uh, continued 
exploring other musical um, ways of reaching uh, reaching potential students, reaching out to potential students, um, and inspiring people to do something creative with Yiddish. Because um, obviously, when people take Yiddish classes, it's not because they need to travel to uh, to 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 a to 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 some mythical Yiddish land and be able to ask for directions on the street. Although there are places where Yiddish would come in handy precisely for those purposes. But, you know, um, that's, it's a separate conversation. Um, but primarily people are interested in what Yiddish culture has to offer. So the cultural component has to be, has to be, at the center, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, you just grammar and other more technical uh, aspects of the language study should be ignored. Um, but um, the um, what I always uh, try to uh, to have my students do is uh, pursue independent projects, uh, creative projects. Some students write new Yiddish songs, others uh, translate Yiddish poetry into their native language. And in, uh, in, in, in Montreal, it may be English, French, um, make Yiddish, short Yiddish films, um, conduct Yiddish, um, Yiddish uh, interviews, and so on and so forth. Um, so last, a few years ago, one of my students decided to translate a Yiddish song, um, a very famous Yiddish song called Die Verbe, Die Verbe, um, which is um, which is a song uh, originally written in Hebrew by Chaim Nachman Bialik. Um, she, translated, she translated it into English and it became quite a hit. And I have sung it uh, ever since. Um, I added a couple of my own uh, verses in English. And now the song exists in three different versions, Hebrew, Yiddish, and, uh, and English. Um, now it's uh, it's we we don't have enough time for me to sing all these Yiddish songs, um, so what I'm going to do instead is show you one particular example of Yiddish um, Yiddish singing Yiddish song um, used for teaching the language. Um, you may know that Yiddish has many irregular verb forms. Now, as in a number of other European languages, uh, to form the past tense in Yiddish, you can use either, um, you, you, can, you need to take the past participle of the verb, and um, also one of the two auxiliary verbs, sein or haben, to be or to have. And you need to know which verb uh, goes with which auxiliary. Um, I thought about how to uh, help students memorize the, 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 the verbs that come, that, that take sein, to be, uh, because the rest take hoben. There's one special group uh, of about 30 verbs that all require sein. Um, and in the end, I came up with this idea of writing a song that would only include 
verbs that take sein. They would be in the past tense. And so you would sing this song, learn this song, and you'd, you'd do very well on your next Yiddish verb quiz. Now, this is what, um, this is what I did with that particular exercise. Um, I decided to use pictures or including many emojis. So it looks very, uh, to, to really appeal to, to young people. Um, let me show you. This is what it looked like. Yes, Zion. In many ways, it travels the world to do various events. No, that's not what I meant. Will be able to Oops. How about here? Yes, this is, ways, this is, this is, this is, travels this, the world. No, one second, let me try. How about this? No, um, one second. I know I can do this. Uh, there, yes. So the verbs uh, that take sign are mostly verbs of motion, to walk, to go, to run, to swim, to fly, and so on. But there are other verbs that describe your uh, position in space, for instance, to sit, to lie down, to hang, um, to also to become, to die, to sleep. So it's, it's, it's a pretty uh, diverse group of uh, verbs. And this is what I did. The story described the, in, the, in the song is very simple. A person, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the person uh, telling the story is a young man who fell in love with a girl and they were very happy. They were in love. One, one day they were sitting together at the house, kissing, chatting. Then he was asleep. And while he was asleep, this witch comes in and kidnaps his bashert, his, his beloved. After that, he, when he discovers she's missing, he has to travel all over the world and to do all these different, go through all these different uh, movements, motions, uh, hanging, flying, crawling, swimming, and so on, until he finally finds her, they're reunited, there's a great party, and finally, um, Yes, the party with Yiddish klezmer musicians, with drinking wine, and the song describing this uh, happy ending is published in multiple uh, copies. So that's that's what the song is about. Um, and now, let me. Let me show it to you. Here we go. Here we go. Yes. So this is what, what it would look like. So. Okay. Seize me. No. Seize ihr Gefäll. Dos schnirl karellen, sis mir gefällen, ihr schöner Stern, sie dos ziehen, sis gewen die Siebe, ist gich gewachsen, 
in uns die Liebe. Sie dost sich jenzis, geben die Siebe, ist gich gewachsen. In uns die Liebe, ich bin gesessen mit mein Prinzessin und es ist gestiegen, der Vergenigen, wenn ich bin später gepoffen, ruhig, ist loyal Eichem, geschehen das Unglück, wenn ich bin später gepoffen, ruhig, ist loyal Eichem. Geschen das Unglück. Sie sah nach Schäfe zu uns gekommen und mit meinen Liebster ist sie an Thronen. Ich bin geblieben wie in nach Holen. Ich bin gestanden als stummer Golem. Ich bin geblieben wie in nach Holen. Ich bin gestanden als stummer Golem. Ich bin gegangen, äh, ich bin durch Wälder und Städte gegangen. Ich bin gesprungen, ich bin gehangen, ich bin gelaufen und nicht geschlafen. Ich bin geflogen mit heute Augen. Ich bin gelaufen und nicht geschlafen. Ich bin geflogen mit heute Eugen. Ich bin gegangen, ich bin geritten, reingefahren zu die Banditen. Ich bin geschwommen, ich bin gekrochen, noch nicht verschwunden ist mein Betochen. Ich bin geschwommen, ich bin gekrochen, noch nicht verschwunden ist mein Betochen. Ich bin gesunken in tiefer Blotte, aber weggeflogen ist mein Kapote. Ich bin geflogen in Masse Eutos, ich bin geflogen an Apikoires. Ich bin geflogen in Masse Eutos, ich bin geflogen. Apikoires, es seinen Trören bei mir gerunnen, bin halb gestorben. Oh no, you can't see it. You can't see it. <gasps> It's okay, the song was wonderful anyway. <laughs> okay, here. Can you see it now? We do. You do see it? Okay. Then I'll start from sinking. Ich bin gesunken in tiefer Blotte, aber geflogen ist mein Kapote. Ich bin geflogen in Masse Eutos. Ich bin geflogen an Apikoires. Ich bin geflogen in Masse Eutos. Ich bin geflogen. An Apikoires, es seinen Tränen bei mir gerungen. Ich bin halb gestorben und doch gekommen zu mein Bescherter. Es ist alles gelungen, weil es ist die Liebe mir durchgedrungen. Zu mein Bescherter, es ist alles gelungen, weil es ist die Liebe mir durchgedrungen. Da große Simche ist stark geroten, ach, Evre Klesmer ist aufgetroten, geflossen Maschke ist bis Baginen und sie ist auf morgen das Lied erschienen, geflossen Maschke ist bis Baginen und sie ist auf morgen das Lied erschienen. La 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 la
pam, pam. Now, I would like to make sure that you get to ask some questions and I'm very happy to, 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 to tell you more specific things in response to your questions. Well, well, thank you. Um, I, I've, I'm, I've really enjoyed everything you've done so far. The, the, the jokes, the, the singing, the, the stories of, of teaching Yiddish. And I know, I know our congregants have also, and I checked with Rabbi Infeld, we both thought the joke was very funny. <laughs> and, and, I, and I appreciate how you uh, showed us bit by bit in the translation so that we wouldn't get the punchline too early. <laughs> what, do you mind if I take down the screen share while we do some questions? Absolutely. Well, I, I think I uh, already uh, stopped it. Okay, yeah. great. So I, I, um, I've gotten several questions and I know it's getting a little late for us and very late for you on the East Coast. So I appreciate that. Well, Thank you for spending time with us so I'm, late. I'm fine as long as you are. Um, so I combined a few questions as much as I could. One of them is about the future of, of Yiddish. Someone asked, what does the future of Yiddish look like? Will it survive? And you know, I'm I'm one about Yiddish in Montreal, and I spent five years in in Australia, where there's a big uh, secular Yiddish culture, as you might know, but there's also a big Yiddish culture among the Hasidic and ultra Orthodox. And so, in my mind, um, a question about the future of Yiddish often sort of balances between, or maybe there's a tension between Yiddish thriving in some ways in ultra Orthodox communities and Yiddish thriving in secular communities that are having camps and retreats and, and teaching at Harvard? Yes, that's a very good question. And Mont in Montreal, we're blessed with having very strong examples of both worlds. We have the best of both worlds. Uh, we have uh, a, a large um, Yiddish speaking Hasidic population uh, and we have a very old and well-established tradition of secular Yiddish culture, uh, concentrated around the Yiddish, uh, the Jewish uh, public library in Montreal, where thousands of Yiddish um, lectures and uh, uh, various events have taken place since uh, the 1950s, and all of this has been recorded. Uh, since the 1950s, we have many of these uh, events uh, available as audios, and I use these a lot in my teaching. But today, too, we have some uh, uh, Yiddish, secular Yiddish events. And as for the ultra-Orthodox community, um, obviously, it's not always easy to build bridges if you just, uh, you know, if one of my student uh, goes to, uh, uh, I was about to say Stanford Hill, that would be uh, London, uh, the Mile End, and just try to start a conversation in Yiddish, it would be pretty challenging because chances are the person, the, the chosid in question will, 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 will reply in English. And especially if you are a uh, woman, you will face challenges entering buildings like uh, yeshivas or uh, uh, synagogues and so on. Um, so I organized, I, I regularly organized tours of this, of, of the Yiddish neighborhood. I take my students and we go there and explore. And I, um, I sometimes prepare things in advance but I always try to demonstrate how things work if you are not prepared. So just improvisation, pure improvisation. I, uh, I, I, I accost uh, some obvious Yiddish speakers on the street and uh, ask them a few questions. And many of them agree to talk to the students like this on the street. And a few times we were invited inside synagogues, even, uh, you know, both boys and girls. Uh, everyone behaved very respectfully. And it was a fascinating experience for students to see Yiddish so alive, uh, hear little children uh, playing in Yiddish and, 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 and listen to the locals 
talk about their 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 uh, uh, dedication to Yiddish. I myself have uh, spent a lot of time chatting with uh, Hasidic Yiddish speakers. Uh, in fact, uh, this is, uh, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna show you the whole video, but this is one of my Yiddish speaking friends in London. And, and you can see me, this is about nine years ago. And believe it or not, my uh, admission uh, ticket to this family, to the hearts of these children, was the famous Yiddish song, Afan Bripicek, the Ralev base. Afan Bripicek, Brent Afairel, you know, the, the, the Rebbe teaching the children Aleph base. Um, the kids loved it, and I later um, offered to teach one of the kids guitar, to give free guitar lessons. And we became uh, good friends. And I recorded, I interviewed a lot of uh, people in, in, in Stamford Hill in London and later also in New York and Montreal. This particular family has four kids, and uh, Yiddish is their Yiddish is their first language. I mean, their main language. Uh, so it's 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 very special. But when it comes to the future of Yiddish, well, I mean, uh, look, uh, this is uh, this is this is also my students uh, doing. A, an original Yiddish Purim spiel. This is a cake that we baked that says Yiddish and we later used it for this movie. Uh, fast forwarding, it's called Our Purim Spiel. With the names of all the students, McGill University, April 2019. Uh, it's a 15 minute long uh, movie in uh, in in Yiddish. There are there is a future for Yiddish. Um, I think that the ultra-Orthodox world um, has a big role to play in that. Um, take, for instance, the, uh, the, the, uh, the recent, uh, right, the recent uh, TV uh, uh, exposure of uh, audiences in, in, in many different countries to ultra-Orthodox uh, life, thanks to uh, uh, Stiesel and, uh, the, and Unorthodox, these uh, series, uh, these shows um, had uh, inspired many Yiddish, uh, many students to, 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 uh, to take Yiddish and to come to me with, with specific questions. Uh, and there are people from leaving the ultra-Orthodox communities and um, maintaining interest in Yiddish. I've had students from those communities who uh, take my classes because they've never, they've never had a chance to explore secular Yiddish literature. You know, even uh, someone like Sholem Aleichem or Isaac Beshevis Singer would be considered uh, treif, uh, treif posel in their communities. And they never studied Yiddish grammar or, uh, you know, Yiddish, Yiddish as an academic subject. So they, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful cultural exchange because they teach the students from uh, secular families, everything about religion and 
them, they themselves learn. Uh, you have a cultural exchange among. It's fascinating that you have a cultural exchange among different types of Jews with Yiddish as the uh, as the catalyst. I, I know everyone. It's getting a bit late, and it's after midnight now for Dr. Ben Yapin. I wanted to ask Rabbi Infel to share a thought or two. Um, he gave me and uh, Nikki the the idea to invite. Uh, Dr. Ben Yappen, uh, many months ago when we conceived of this series. Rabbi Infeld? So, um, first of all, thank you to Dr. Ben Yappen. And actually, you can see behind me the other redhead at McGill. Um, <laughs> and, I and I had asked Avi Shai, who's the most popular professor in all of Jewish studies at McGill? And he told me, there's this Yiddish professor, Yorei Vadiyapen. And, and so I said, that's, that's going to be one of the people we're going to invite for, for, um, for our scholar uh, Zoom series. So we want to thank Avishai for helping us lead to uh, Dr. Vadiyapen's uh, coming and joining us. And I don't think Avishai, Avishai is a Judaic studies major, but hasn't yet taken Yiddish. So, um, so I do think that if he takes Yiddish next semester, that this would be a good reason to give him a good grade. Oh, that's besides the point. <laughs> as, of, as of tonight, I think he's quite obligated to take your course. You know? <laughs> and we want to thank, we want to thank you, uh, Dr. Vyapin, for an excellent, excellent academic and yet also entertaining, engaging presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. And for sharing us My with us, your wisdom and your skill and, and how it is that you go about engaging and bringing students across the world into the world of Yiddish. Um, I, I also want to thank, of course, um, Harley and Eleanor for helping to put together, for helping us with this whole series. And I wanna thank Nikki for all of her hard work on this series. And finally, I was on sabbatical for the beginning. And so Rabbi Stein also helped put the whole thing together. So I wanna thank Rabbi Stein and I wanna thank you all for being with us. By the way, next week, we are zooming again once, um, once again into Montreal uh, for our BI primetime series as Tommy Schnurmacher, who for those of you who are from Montreal may know of him, he's going to be speaking about his, um, his, his life as an entertainer, a comedian, a journalist, and his book on how his mother survived Auschwitz, all putting that all together. So please join us for that. And, and you know, when you talked about the piece at Harvard, it reminded me, I, I assume Dr. Uh, Appen, that you've heard, uh, you heard what um, James Carville said just a few weeks ago. James Carville, the famous, uh, the famous political advisor in the United States to the Democratic Party said, you know, the Democrats really need to, this non-Jewish guy, right? He said, the Democrats really need to begin to speak the people of the language. They need to stop speaking Hebrew and start speaking Yiddish. Um, and it was, it was a great line that, that when you spoke about, when people ask you what you do at Harvard, uh, it reminded me of that mix and that, and that um, interplay. So again, I wanna, I wanna thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing all of you, oh, so many of our events over the course of this next week. And um, Rabbi Stein, feel free to unmute people so we can uh, thank, uh, Professor Rede Yappen and, uh, and everyone can say hello as well. And, and I think this is Hebrew. I mean, I think this is Yiddish rather. We, uh, or we can all schmooze a little. Yeah. That is a good word, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation, Dr. Van Yappen. Thank you for a coming on this way. Very beautiful My voice. My pleasure. Ashenim dank. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So it was a machai to hear Yiddish being spoken for a change. I'm from Montreal, so I, I grew up I grew up speaking Yiddish at home only. Um, I wanted to let everybody know if anybody's interested, there's two Yiddish groups that meet in Vancouver. We've been reading on Zoom. So if anybody's interested, contact me and I'll give you the information. Who, who just said that? Every week, and the other group meets twice a month. And actually, two of Karpinovich's nieces live in Vancouver, and a person who translated wow. those stories also lives in Vancouver. Translated those wow, those that is stories. so exciting. Mm -hmm.
Thank that you. Of Seth course, Shady, again, Seth Shady is such a good. Yeah, if anybody's interested in reading Yiddish, just get in touch with me. Well, thank you, Shady. Maybe I will. You have a beautiful voice. We really enjoy the music. Shainam Dank. Yuri, I want to say I was I was glad to hear Oifen Pripichik finally towards the end of the hour and a half together. Our cantor from my shul growing up, he, he grew up in Berlin and left after Kristallnacht and went to Shanghai and then the US. And every year he would sing that with his guitar to the kindergartner kids uh, as, as we graduated from kindergarten. Wow. I certainly know that. Right. Great other, it's another example of a, a Yiddish song about grammar, right? Mm -hmm. That is true. Although, you know, all it says about Yiddish grammar is the correct pronunciation of one particular letter, Komets Aleph, Komets Aleph O. And of Very course, the funny thing is that if you are a uh, Polish Yiddish speaker, you would sing the same song, but pronounce it differently. Komets Aleph Ooh, yeah. it would be a different sound. Exactly. So there isn't even agreement there. Teaching uh -huh. them to read Hebrew, not Yiddish, and he's teaching them Ashkenazi Hebrew. That's right. But the way Hebrew is pronounced would depend on what part of Yiddish land they of live course, in. Of course. And what Yiddish dialect they speak. Is yeah. it Litvish Yiddish? Is it Polish Yiddish? Is it Valiner Yiddish? <laughs> So I many different. Yiddish. I can recognize the Polish Yiddish right away. Like, are they still teaching Hebrew? Hebrew? Are they still teaching Yiddish at Bialik and the Jewish? Yes, people? they are. My grandchildren just took it. They in Toronto, but actually, the Yiddish day school. I mean, in, I'm talking about, I'm talking about Montreal. They didn't teach dialect. in Montreal. They as far as I know, there are no Yiddish classes there. I may be wrong. No, but my I think the folk, is, Shula, the folk Shula teaches Yiddish. The folk Shula in Montreal teaches Yiddish. Teaches Yiddish. My, Bialik in Toronto teaches Yiddish, but it's my not, kids went to those. Not schools. a very high yeah. level. That's Shani. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I I have a story about um, Yiddish. Um, my daughter used to um, room with a young Jewish man, who fell in love with a Polish woman from Poland, who was learning Yiddish. And they actually got married. And the problem was that the, the mother had been um, uh, in the Holocaust. And um, it was very difficult because she wouldn't accept her daughter-in-law, who was not Jewish, spoke, had learned to speak Yiddish. And it was actually quite sad. But um, Yiddish was the thing that put them together. Right. And she could actually speak with the mother-in-law. Huh. Weird. Mm. Funny. Yes. I remember. I remember my mother, who was a first generation born in Canada, uh, singing often Pripichik to me, and that's how I learned my one Yiddish, because my parents both knew how to speak Yiddish, but they never taught their children how to speak Yiddish. So, but that was the one thing that I could learn, and I I still remember it today. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Dr. Ved and Yevin, I was very impressed with your guitar playing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I can see you don't need a capo. You you can play all the chords without one. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I uh, I I I take um, I participate in uh, various uh, music festivals sometimes as well especially the one in uh, Germany called Yiddish Summer Weimar. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, I even took part in a brand new Yiddish opera um, based on the story on, on the story of Purim. Mm -hmm. So I had to, I played uh, the Mele Chachashverish and uh, I had two more roles that are um, not in the Book of Esther. So these are... It was based on uh, the poetry of Itzik Manger, the Yiddish poet, and believe it or not, uh, Goethe, the great German poet Goethe, also wrote a Purim spiel. And believe it or not, he even studied Yiddish. 
he was interested in uh, Jews. He studied Hebrew, but then he also studied Yiddish and uh, wrote a Purim spiel in uh, German. Um, and we decided to put, put the two authors, the two literary traditions together and stage it in the city of Weimar uh, in Germany. It was very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, so, so on my Yiddish teaching map, Germany, Israel, Canada, the US, Russia, all occupy important uh, mm -hmm. places. Nice. And it's, it's, it's a very different experience, you know, teaching Yiddish in Germany where the language is so close. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, the history is so complicated. So it's, it's, you have to reorient yourself linguistically and culturally. Interesting. But uh, music is, is, is all is important for me, uh, tremendously important. And I think that it was, it was probably that, yeah, I think that Yiddish songs really captured my imagination mm -hmm. and helped me, helped, helped me get interested in the literature behind them too. Mm -hmm. Do they still have Class Canada uh, as far as you know? Yes, Class Canada. Canada, of course, uh, Class Canada. Well, the last summer it was uh, conducted online. And from what I understand, I didn't actually participate that time, but I heard it was a big success. Uh, and it's still a caffeinated group? Um, well, um, yes, when it was- When it's, uh, when it's not COVID. Physical, yes, it was there. I, I was I, I I was there a couple of times, yes, at that uh, Jewish summer camp with the cabins, oh, cabins, very romantic. I've been there. <laughs> but just as you have said, where music is such a very important part of your life, it's been a most important part of my life. And uh, one of the, of course, the most popular songs, "If I Was a Rich Man," has been always part of my repertoire. Mm -hmm. And as you know, they've been made a beautiful rendition of that in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And I was in the process of learning the, if I was a rich man, in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yes. Well, it's another, it's another great uh, way to uh, uh, teach the conditional. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and believe it or not, it's one of the two, one of the only two voice recordings of Sholem Aleichem that we have today where oh. you can hear his own voice. Uh, you know, it was uh, recorded on a, I think like a wax cylinder or something very primitive. So it's, the quality isn't very good, but one of the two recordings, this is from 19, the 1910s in New York. Yeah. Sholem Aleichem died in 1915. Uh, 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 sorry, 16. Uh, so the he reads his monologue, Wenn ich bin Rothschild, if I were Rothschild. Uh, it's a short monologue. You know? And of course, it's based on the famous joke where, you know, this uh, Melamed or someone says, if, if I were Roth, Rothschild, I would be richer than he. I'll call you right back. I'm in the middle of a Zoom. Now, there's a... There's a, um, until Broadway closed, isn't there a, a completely Yiddish version of Fiddler on the Roof that was playing in New York uh, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago? Did you see it? I, I, I did. And uh, yeah, I, I, I know some people who, uh, who were in it. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah, it was fun. I have the record in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. There you go. That is, I, that is very interesting. I yeah. was born in France and uh, I was born in France and there is a big Ashkenazi Jewish community. There is also a big Sephardi community, but there is a big Ashkenazi community. And I think my first language was actually Yiddish, hearing it. Mm -hmm. It was when I was born, my parents spoke Yiddish. Uh, the way I learned Yiddish is like somebody else said by listening to my parents. I didn't understand, but I would pick a word here and there. There was a word in French in the middle. 
and I started understanding. And my husband makes fun of me when I speak Yiddish, but my mother liked to sing. And some of the first songs I heard was Margaritkes and Yiddish Mame. And this, this is something, you know, when you're exposed to this, it stays with you forever. It's in really in your, in your soul. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. It has a koyach. I think we should um, allow uh, Dr. Vedeyepin to, yes. to make it to bed at some point tonight. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't know if you're teaching a class tomorrow, but... Uh, <laughs> no, thankfully not. But, you know, I have other things to go do. To bed. <laughs> yes, so, right. well, thank you, everyone. I, I have to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi Enfield and Rabbi Stein and Nikki. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very for much you, for making this yes. possible. My, my, yeah. my, my next, my yeah. next teaching, uh, my next teaching gig is uh, for the Yiddish Summer Program in New York City um, wow. at YIVO. But this summer it will be. Uh, it will all be virtual, so taught on Zoom. But uh, I will be there. Great. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure to meet you. Thanks. Good night. Thank you My pleasure. Hashem dank. Mazel und Bruch. A gute Nacht or a gute Nacht, depending on your dialect. A gute Nacht is with your Polish. Polish, a gute Nacht. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night. Hi, Harley. Good night. Good night, rabbis. Hey, rabbis. Oh, yeah. Nikki, can you hear me?